Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation looking at qualitative research methods, especially from the point of view of interpretivism and constructivism, utilising both of those two elements within your qualitative study. Of course, whenever you are doing qualitative inquiry, you need to have a particular lens on. You need to be able to look at the um, the, the, the particular data that you're gathering and to be able to interpret them in specific ways. So it's very important that you do get some understanding about the particular epistemological lens that you're using for your studies. If it was quantitative research, of course, that's often spoken about in positivist or post-positive post -positivist terms. And it could be that you are using elements of both of these within your particular um, research project. So it may be that you're going to be uh, specifically quantitative uh, to start with and then explore this in greater depth through qualitative or you may even be doing it the other way around gathering some qualitative data first and then looking how that fits into the numbers so in that case if you are combining the two genres then you would talk about that as doing um, mixed methods study because if you're looking at the numbers um, from the point of view of quantitative research methods, look how this particular quote that I got somewhere on the internet in 2016 really applies. That positivist epistemology assumes that only facts derived from the scientific method can make legitimate knowledge claims. And from that basis, it's a case that well, if we don't know the answer to particular things yet, it's just because we haven't done the right research or come across how to do the right research to understand those. So from a positivist point of view, um, all that we know, especially within healthcare, is only seen through the point of view of, well, have we done the research studies on this yet? Can we prove or disprove something? So knowledge is constructed in very specific ways there. And that gives the impression that there is a simple truth in life. And as you'll see from this little cartoon here, there is no simple truth in life. But interpretivism will also give you the skills in which to ask different questions about uh, similar phenomena that are just experienced differently by various people. So look at this glass here. Um, which, which is your starting point? How would you describe yourself in relation to how you would understand this glass half full or half empty? Or are you going to be an opportunist, a pragmatist even, and uh, drink the wine and don't give a damn about what the results are? So when it comes to interpretivism, let me read this quote out at you here, because it's starting off by looking at interpret uh, interpretivism in relation to ontology and epistemology. Now, we've looked at both of those already on our um, uh, research methods course. So epistemology is the study of the way in which we know things. So how do you know what you say you know. And ontology is the ways of being that are often constructed or viewed as constructed uh, through the various epistemological lens that we use. So from the position of interpretivism in relation to ontology and epistemology, interpretivists believe that reality is multiple and relative. So just from the point of view of different people's perspectives, like with that glass of wine, different people are going to view it in different ways. And it could be relative, it could be dependent on where they are in the world, how they see the world at the moment, um, their particular experiences, beliefs. So all of this is rather relative. It's not the fixed um, uh, situation of provable facts uh, that the quantitative research would look at. Lincoln and Goober are two really famous uh, research authors. So often when you're looking at research methods books, you'll find a lot written by these two and well worth dipping into what they're saying. They are seen as sort of foundational in some of the information they give upon which loads of other research studies are built. So Lincoln and Goober explain these multiple realities that they also depend on other systems of meaning which make it more difficult to interpret in terms of fixed realities. So even from the point of view of gender differences, for example, people of different genders may perceive the same reality going on, but in very, very different ways. So meanings are constructed 
constructivism. Uh, meanings are constructed by individuals. And it's when their wider societies then take on that meaning, that's when it's often called constructionism. Okay, so constructivism, constructionism. Um, and the, the, the knowledge acquired in the discipline is socially constructed rather than objectively determined. So lots of real world matters that go on can't be emulated or reproduced within a laboratory setting. It's the real world settings that we're looking at. And therefore, how people perceive these will depend on where they are at at the moment in their real world setting. Now, even if we just took the position of trying to understand the words sex and gender, look on this slide how there are so many different interpretations in the square box in the middle. There are so many different ways in which we might understand sex and gender. So even if we ask a person, well, what is your sex? Are we talking about their biological what they were assigned at birth? Um, are we talking about sex as in activities? So there are lots of different meanings and the words mean uh, um, maybe different things to various individuals. But then when you look at meaning through different angles, through different lens, look at the ways in which some of the big blurbs on the outside can give a very different understanding of what's in the middle. So from the point of view of some of the, the, the blurbs on the outside here, look at the difference and stop and pause and think about it. What's the difference between sexual orientation and sexual preference? Okay, there are real big differences in both of those terms. However, sometimes in many societies, both those terms are conflated. They're brought together and people understand them as being um, the same, just two different words for the same thing. But you could argue, no, they aren't at all. And therefore, whenever you're using words, it's really important to understand the meanings of the words, the differences, the implications. All of that is part of um, interpretation, um, especially around interpretation of meanings. And then some of the other words on here. So hegemony is a really important term that you need to um, understand for your research studies, especially if your research is focused on people who are somehow disadvantaged. Um, you might see in some research books, they talk about the underdogs or people whose voices aren't often heard. People on the margins would be a term often used in feminism. So hegemony is an ancient Greek word that means a form of power. But especially in femi feminist writings today, it's used in a way of a negative power over others, as in dominance or domination over others. So when you look at patriarchal societies where uh, males are over females and patriarchy or patriarchy, however you want to prefer it, uh, uh, pronounce it, patriarchy is, usually refers to older males over all others. So if they're the ones ruling a particular society, then the society will be seen through their perspectives. And it's a hegemonic relationship because they're the ones who win out all the time and everybody else is subjugated under them. So that's what the word hegemony would look at. But even when you're talking about feminist studies and femininities or masculine studies and masculinities, what do all these different words mean? So whenever you use a particular word that may have different meanings, explore that word, show exactly what uh, you understand by it and how it's being used within your studies. Immutability means something that's unchangeable. So say, for example, the colour of my skin. This is an immutable attribute of me. I can't change the colour of my skin. But if we go back to those terms about, um, well, even femininity or masculinity, Look at the way in which some cultures expect, you know, little girls will wear pink, little boys will wear blue, and little girls will play with dollies, and little boys will play with mechanics, toys, and that type of thing. But is there something immutable about maleness or femaleness? What about if those individuals want to play with each other's toys? Um, is it that there's any rightness or wrongness in this? Will some societies view all of this in different ways? So the term immutability is something unchangeable, but especially when you look at biological determinism, that means, so, so the genetics that you're born with, are, are they then biological determini biologically deterministic? It means you've got to do this in life 
because that's what your genes are telling you. Um, so biological determinism is a very scientific way of looking at things. And especially when you're talking about transgender people, for example, um, all of this is going to be really questioned here. And even using terminology like gender assigned at birth is the preferred term terminology to use today, uh, rather than talking about people of sex change, which is very old fashioned language now. Um, and especially going back to the sexual orientation and preferences. So the orientation is the way a person's facing, literally means the way you're facing in life. It's um, a, an orientation. Whereas preference is what you choose. Um, you might choose something today, you may not want it tomorrow. So there is a difference there. But when people conflate those and bring them together and think that they're both identical ways of saying the same thing, no, they're not. Because nobody chooses our sexual orientation okay so but that's why uh, the word immutability comes in then so is sexual orientation something that's immutable unchangeable another debate for another time but that's what i'm hoping to show you here with all these different words look at the ways in which they can be interpreted by different peoples different times different situations different histories or geographies okay so really important to understand these as part of your research studies